Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone. One of the most popular features of our show is our Gone But Not Forgotten series, celebrating the careers and legacies of the greatest stars who are no longer with us. Today's guest is descended from show business royalty. She's the granddaughter of one of the most popular and beloved music artists of all time, the fabulous Peggy Lee, whose contributions to the world of popular music and jazz were monumental. Over her seven decade career, she recorded over 1,100 songs and released over 50 albums with over 100 top 100 hit singles, including Somebody Else Is Taking My Place, Why Don't You Do Right, Golden Earrings, Riders in the Sky, Is That All There Is, Lover, and of course, everybody's favorite, Fever for which she came up with that distinctive arrangement and she wrote new lyrics. As a matter of fact, Peggy Lee was an extraordinary songwriter who wrote or co-wrote over 270 songs, including her hits, Little Fool, What More Can a Woman Do, I Don't Know Enough About You, It's a Good Day, and Manana. For the Disney movie Lady and the Tramp, she co-wrote all of the original songs and she supplied the singing and speaking voices of four characters. She also wrote songs for many other movies, including Anatomy of a Murder, The Jazz Singer, The Rawhide Years, Johnny Guitar, Tom Thumb, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, Walk, Don't Run, and many more. She appeared in 10 movies, including Stage Door Canteen, The Powers Girl, Jazz Ball, Mr. Music, The Jazz Singer, and my personal favorite, Pete Kelly's Blues, for which she received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress and the Audience Award for Most Promising Female Personality of 1955. Miss Lee received 13 Grammy Award nominations, including one win, plus a Lifetime Achievement Grammy Award. She was the first female recipient of two awards from the Songwriters Guild of America, the Aggie Award for her composing skills and the President's Award for her support of young emerging songwriters. In 1990, she won the ASCAP Pied Piper Award, and two years later, she was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. She received two honorary doctorates, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and in 2020, the ASCAP Foundation established the annual Peggy Lee Songwriter Award. Peggy Lee was a creative powerhouse who directed her life and career on her own terms. But for her millions of fans like me, it's all about her quietly captivating voice that continues to resonate with audiences of all ages. I'm thrilled to welcome Peggy Lee's granddaughter, Holly Foster Wells, to our show. Holly, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Harvey. That was quite an introduction. You could write my grandmother's bio. Well, I'm very familiar with her career. I absolutely adored her. I want to start by talking about your personal relationship with your grandmother. I understand you traveled with her on tour a lot when you were young, correct? Yes, when I was just six years old. Well, I, I suppose it was earlier than that, even with my family, but me by myself, without my mom and without my brothers, I was six years old and she started just taking me on the road with her. Tell me what it was like being backstage with her or in the recording studio. Well, it depended on the day, to be perfectly honest. I mean, there were days when it was stressful. I mean, this she was a perfectionist. She wanted everything to be just right for the audience and for, for her, for her pride and her work. And so it could be really stressful getting ready for a show or, it, you know, it could be a, a good day where she was more relaxed. Quite often that had to do with the musicians that were around her. They would make her feel comfortable and, and whatever the club is. So that's, the, that's the truth. It could be really stressful. It was a, it was a process for her to become Peggy Lee. It was like a four hour process where she would really transform herself into my grand, you know, from my grandmother into Miss Peggy Lee, who you saw on stage. Did she have a different personality on the stage than the person you knew off stage? I wouldn't say a different personality because she she had she brought 
both sides to both sides of her life, but she definitely had the the woman that was at home with me being a grandmother in bed, watching soap operas versus this, this glamorous persona that we see on stage. And, you know, sometimes she would even refer to the star, she'd call her the star or her, you know, she'd say she, you know, oh, that's the star. Like that's a different part of her, but obviously she didn't have multiple personalities, but she definitely had a stage persona. I read that your grandmother told you when you were only six years old, that you would be the one to carry on her legacy. Is that right? It is right. And it's so interesting to me that she had the foresight to think about this business beyond her lifetime, because when when she said this to me, the business of estates wasn't such a big thing like it is now. It's common like to know about all these big estates like Elvis or Marilyn Monroe or Audrey Hepburn or Frank Sinatra. But it wasn't really the case back then. But she, she said, this music will outlive me and you're going to run my company. And, and she told me, you know, this company is going to take care of your family. I think she was very concerned with leaving a legacy for her family, especially for her only child, who was my mom. And so she said, this is what you're doing. My mom was an artist, a painter, a painter, and and she wasn't into the business side of things. So my grandmother just groomed me to do this. And here I am doing it. So how old were you, Holly, before you fully understood exactly what was involved in directing your grandmother's legacy? Well, to be honest with you, I didn't really understand it until close to when she passed away. And she passed away in 2002 when she was 81 years old. She had had a stroke three years before she passed away. And it ended up being really a debilitating stroke. So I ended up stepping in. Well, let me back up and say that I did work for her for a long time. And then when I became in, you know, my early twenties, I wanted to do my own career and I went to college and I worked in television for a while, which she was not very happy by the way, that I wanted to break away and do something different, but she respected it and she understood it. But she said, you just need to promise me that you're going to do this when I'm gone. And I said, of course, I'm going to do this when you're gone. Well, then she had this stroke and it became clear she wasn't going to bounce back from that. So I ended up leaving my my job in television. I worked at the time for Castle Rock Television. I worked on Seinfeld, actually, in the art department. And so I, st- I started learning about really what it takes to maintain this legacy when it was close to, you know, her passing away. And then I wish that I had asked a lot more questions and I, every day I have questions, you know, that I wish I could have, I could have asked her, but thankfully she did train me a lot. You're the president of Peggy Lee Associates. Tell us what your major responsibilities are in that job. So basically it's keeping her legacy alive, introducing her music to new listeners. It's reissuing CD products and books and maintaining her social media accounts, but the bulk of it has to do with licensing music. We license her music for a lot of radio, you know, film, television commercials, and TV shows. So it's all that. And then there's so much work you wouldn't even believe just, you know, renewing copyrights and protecting copyrights. When you see that there's, you know, bootleg uses around the world, dealing with it because you can't let that go. So it's a, it is a full-time job. And honestly, there's not enough hours in the day to do all the things there are to just, cause it's policing the the world. It's releasing product in the world. It's looking at what's happening in different countries with her music. It, it's crazy. Well, she's so relevant today. She's so popular today as much as she ever was. So I can imagine there is a lot of licensing and a lot of Peggy Lee presence in the world because we see it. I remember hearing Do Right. I think it was in Mrs. Maisel. Am I right? 
Yes, we've had we've put a bunch of songs in Mrs. Maisel. Thank, I love that music supervisor. <laughs> She's wonderful, and there are many, many films and commercials. And it's it's interesting how the opportunities come. Like I don't even have to really go out there and pitch this. It just they come. They find her on streaming platforms and come to us, which is great. Do you feel you're doing the job the way she wanted you to? I hope I am. I have to say it's a huge responsibility. I feel everything I do, I think about, is this what she would want? And there are some times when I think, well, she didn't know about streaming or she didn't know about how could she have known about Netflix or whatever? And I think I'm going to do it because it's in the best interest of her legacy. But I do wonder all the time, like, is this what she would want? I want to make her her proud. She was so certain of how she wanted to be remembered. And so I try and keep that in mind all the time. It's a big responsibility too, like even speaking for her on behalf of her, because she was someone who was so careful about her words and about how she came across. So I'm careful. Well, I don't think she could have found a better person. I can tell you that. And I must ask you, Holly, are you responsible for maintaining the Peggy Lee website, PeggyLee.com? Yes, I am. I do work. I have a wonderful team of people that I work with that help me with that. But yes, that is definitely something that I'm in charge of. Well, I have to tell you something. Of all the celebrity websites I've ever seen, and I've seen hundreds of them, the Peggy Lee website is the most thorough and complete website. It gives you all the information you would ever want to know about your grandmother, her career, and her body of work. Congratulations. Well, thank you. And I have to give credit to really to two incredible people who made that happen. One is David Torreson, who was one of my grandmother's fans who just back in the 1990s when the internet was kind of a new thing, he thought there should be a Peggy Lee website and he created it himself. He went and got the domain and he created the research that went on there and he reached out to my grandmother and her secretary and and he wanted to do it all you know, with their consent and everything. Anyway, he started that and he still to this day continues doing it with me. But in addition to that, we have this incredible researcher named Ivan Santiago Mercado, who has done the most incredible job with this discography. And I learned so much from from Ivan and David about my grandmother's career, because what I knew about her was her as a grandmother. But I've had to, since taking over this job, really learn more about her career. So I give David and Ivan a ton of credit. Well, David and Ivan, I thank you. You made preparing for this interview on my behalf a lot easier. Now, Holly, Peggy Lee had a very tough life and she suffered a lot of hardships. Her mother died when she was only four. And then her father married a woman who was a monstrously abusive stepmother. All four of her marriages ended in divorce. Don't you find it amazing that she somehow had the resilience and the strength to have the hugely successful and long career that she had? I find it amazing. I think about it all the time, actually, because, you know, it's funny. I'm I'm just like, I'm on this journey with my grandmother. And maybe that's why she set it up this way, where every single day I'm working with her music and her life story. And so I'm always trying to figure things out and now seeing things as an adult versus how I saw them when I was a child with her. But, but back to your, you know, your question about she was, she grew up in North Dakota and I just was in North Dakota a week and a half ago for Peggy Lee day. They had a wonderful celebration for her in one of the cities that was important to her Valley city where she got her start on the radio. And to say this was a rural, you know, community is an understatement. She was completely, uh, you know, in the middle of North Dakota on on the prairie. And this is back in the 1920s and 1930s. So it was even more remote where her only lifeline to, you know, outside of her immediate world was the radio and the railroad. So 
she would take the train to get into the bigger cities of North Dakota. And the fact that she had this dream of becoming a singer and she was incredibly shy and in living in railroad depots, being abused and, you know, she had a loving father, but he was an alcoholic and he wasn't able to do his job as the railroad station agent. So she ended up running the railroad a lot. I, I just can't even believe it's, it's like a movie. And in fact, one day we are going to have a movie about her life. It's, it's really unbelievable. So she just had this dream and listening to the radio, it ignited it in her. She just had such a love for music. And it's so amazing that she ended up listening to like Duke Ellington and Count Basie and Benny Goodman. And these are people that she ended up working with and being a contemporary to it's it's, it's astonishing. Cool. And from what I understand from my own research, your grandmother was a spiritual person. She believed in destiny, in the power of positive thinking, in trusting the universe to produce the right result, correct? Correct. She di she discovered her spirituality. Well, first of all, she was just born a seeker. She was always so curious about why we're here and what this is all about. She she started wondering about that when she was just little. And then having her mom die at such a young age really pushed her to search more for answers. And it was when she moved out to Hollywood, a, a neighbor of hers had suggested this Science of Mind Church, um, which is not the same as like Scientology or, or Christian science. It's it's a church that was started by Ernest Holmes, and it it really makes you think about the power of the mind, and we're one mind, and we're connected, and and the power of positive thinking, and that's where she got that, and she she really used her spirituality to try and heal from a lot of the trauma of her early childhood. This was like at a time when people didn't go to therapy or rehab to work through their trauma. So she was trying to do that through her spirituality and also through music. When you listen to some of your grandmother's recordings, like all dressed up with a broken heart, or is that all there is? Can you sometimes detect the pain and the emotional scars and the spirituality in her voice? Yes, that's such a good question. I can hear, I can hear different things when she's singing. I can hear when she's smiling. I can hear when she's annoyed. I can hear when she's in a really playful, good mood. And I can definitely hear when she's going to a vulnerable place and, and a really a place of truth. Do you have a favorite Peggy Lee album? I do have a Peggy, favorite Peggy Lee album, but I have to say it, they keep changing all the time. But the one that I have always been drawn to is one that we recently just released for the first time on CD. And it's called Norma Dolores Eggstrom from Jamestown, North Dakota. And it was the last album that she recorded for Capitol Records. And I'm sure that part of why I'm drawn to it is that that's the album that I first remember, because that's when I was a little girl and traveling with her and she would sing those songs. But it isn't just that. It's just there's such a wisdom in her voice and there's melancholy in her voice that I, I connect to. And, and also I love the, there's a lot of great songs on there. Leon Russell, there's two Leon Russell songs. And of course, I'll be seeing you, which I love. And I have to say one more thing. The charts were written by the most incredible Artie Butler, the beautiful charts. So I hope that your listeners will listen. To, you can stream it or or buy the CD, Norma Dolores Eggstrom. I love it that she named it too after her real name because she wasn't always Peggy Lee. Do you have a favorite Peggy Lee song? Oh my gosh. I can't even say I have a favorite Peggy Lee song. She said her favorite song was The Folks Who Live on the Hill because that I think was her dream that she would find someone to grow old with. And she just loved that song. And she had that incredible Nelson Riddle chart on that song. But for me, I feel like I, I fall in love with 
new songs all the time. I was just listening the other day to the song she sang called Amazing. And it's, I don't even know very many people who would know that song, but oh my gosh, she sounds incredible. Amazing. When I was doing my research for this interview, I was amazed to learn that Capitol Records did not like the song, Is That All There Is? And they didn't want to release it, even though it ended up becoming a huge hit and winning a Grammy. But your grandmother knew what songs were right for her, didn't she? You know, that's that's something that's interesting about her, that she she didn't limit herself. She wasn't afraid to fight for something that she really believed in. And I always think, like, where did she get that permission to do that based on where she came from? And she had a lot of courage. And with Is That All There Is, Lieber and Stoller wrote that song and they sent it to her. And she, uh, the story said, it goes that she called them and said, that's my song. Don't you dare give it to anyone else or I'll have you removed from the earth. And that she went to Capitol and they said, oh no, like we can't record that. It's strange. It's too long. It's bizarre. And this was 1969 and rock and roll was, you know, the rage. And this was far from rock and roll. So, but she, she appealed to the head of Capitol Records and said, look, I, I'm Peggy Lee. I helped build your tower here. And he said, you know what? We'll let you record the demo. And Lieber and Stoller, had heard Randy Newman and asked him to write the chart. He was a, you know, a young arranger at the time. And he wrote that incredible chart. Randy Newman did. They went into the studio, recorded the demo and Capitol Records said, no, we're not going to release it. And my grandmother was heartbroken, but it turns out that they wanted her to appear on a TV show. And because they wanted one of their other artists to appear on this TV show and they weren't going to let the other artists go on without Peggy Lee also going on. So she used that as an opportunity and said, I'll go on that show, but you have to let me sing my song. Is that all there is? And you need to release a limited quantity of the single. And so they did. They did it. And they had me and my shadow on the B side of the single. And the next thing you know, they were all sold out. Like DJs were playing the, the song. People were calling in. What is this song? And and they had to press more. And then they didn't just press more. They they created a whole LP around the song. And she received her 13th Grammy nomination and her very first win. She was 50 years old at the 1970 Grammys when she won that that award and a song that she had to fight for. And it wasn't the first song she had to fight for either. You know? No, it wasn't. She was a remarkably brave woman. You know, another thing, now I'm a lot older than you, I remember this, when The Way We Were was nominated for an Oscar, the song, Barbara Streisand had terrible stage fright and had said that she would not perform it on the Academy Awards show. They couldn't find a female singer that would sing the song on the show because they were no one wanted to be compared to Barbara Streisand and your grandmother stepped up and said I'll do it and of course she knocked it out of the park with a very unique interpretation that didn't compare itself to Barbara Streisand's version at all that not only showed bravery but it showed tremendous musical creativity to reimagine that song in the Peggy Lee fashion don't you think that's just remarkable i do and they're such different singers and their presentation was so different they actually you know it's funny i don't know if they themselves actually met but they both opened the international hotel in 1969 in las vegas barbara was in the big showroom and my grandmother was in the the little littler showroom so and at the time that was the biggest hotel in the world so funny that they both cross paths in that way. Your grandmother wrote an autobiography in the late 80s, and it was reissued last year, and you wrote the foreword. For those people who may already have the first edition, what's new in the reissued edition? What's new in the reissued edition that I'm most excited about is her book of poetry. Back in the 60s, she wrote a, 
a collection of poems, which she called Softly with Feeling. And she just privately published it and gave it as gifts to friends. One of her paramours printed them on this beautiful paper. I have some of the copies here in my office, but but no one read these poems. So in this new bio autobiography, we have her whole collection of poems. And then, of course, I wrote the introduction and Will Friedwald wrote a wonderful epilogue that kind of brings everybody up to speed on what happened since the time she finished writing the book to present time. And then Ivan Santiago Mercado, the wonderful discographer I mentioned, he did a beautiful discography that you can read, you know, all the songs that she's ever recorded and lots of interesting details about it. I think the book is an absolutely must have for every Peggy Lee fan, and I recommend it highly. Now, it's very well known that Peggy Lee was a pioneer, not only because she was one of the first singer songwriters and she had the foresight to establish her own publishing company, Denslow Music, but because she had the guts to take on the Disney Corporation when they tried to deny her any revenue from the video sales of Lady and the Tramp. She won her lawsuit. And because of that legal precedent that she set, she paved the way for every other songwriter to be properly compensated. That is really an amazing, monumental accomplishment, isn't it? It really is. I was with her during that trial. It took a big toll on her. But the, the story goes that, you know, Lady and the Tramp was, first of all, she loved working on that. And she worked with Sonny Burke and meeting Walt Disney was one of the highlights of her career in her life. She just loved him and thought he was such a genius. And to be asked to write these songs on this film and to do so many of those voices. And then even they named a character after her. And also she was able to talk to Walt about the, the plot in the first version of the movie old trustee died and she couldn't take that. So she went to Walt and said, please, could you let him live? And he did, he said for my grandmother. But fast forward to the 80s, when this came out on home video, it was one of the top, well, it was the top grossing video of the year. And she was very excited thinking, I'm going to make a lot of uh, royalties on this. And then when the royalties didn't come, they said, no, no, we paid you back, you know, when you did the movie in the 50s. So she said, no, there's a new technology here. And artists should be able to make money off of their, their work. And you found a new way to make money. We should participate in that. The music was a big part of the film. And so she took them to, to court. And it took years and years, but she won. And it was precedent setting. And even when I went and studied entertainment law when I was in college. Her lawsuit was in the book, in the textbook. She was really proud of that. Well, Holly, I'm not sure if you know this, but I spent 40 years in a courtroom, 26 of them as a judge. Did you, did you know yes. that? Yes, I did know that. So I'm very well aware of the personal toll that it takes to launch a major lawsuit and then have it drag on for years. How did that lawsuit affect your grandmother's health? Well, it was it was stressful for her all the the depositions and meetings with lawyers and all that was it was stressful but also stressful for her getting up every morning and being in downtown LA and looking like Peggy Lee it was every day she had to show up in that courtroom and so those were early mornings for her for, you know for the star <laughs> she's used to you know nightclub hours so it was it was exhausting and and not it was a lot of a lot of standing her ground. I it's interesting I have tapes of her depositions and watching her being grilled by by lawyers was it was kind of a master class in how to hold your ground. She she was a a formidable force. She, when she felt right and she felt like this was right. And she even said the words, Walt would have wanted me to have that money. What a perfect way to put it. I'm sure he would have. Your grandmother died in 2002 at the age of 81. 
And there you were, suddenly left with an entire estate and music publishing company to administer. And I would imagine you had to go through all of her possessions. Was it difficult organizing everything? It it was, I don't know if I would say difficult, but man, what a what a process. I that I will never forget actually the day that she passed away. It, first of all, it was so shocking because she had almost passed away so many times. She had had so many health problems that when it actually happened, it was surreal. And and then I looked around her house, which she lived in a beautiful house in Bel Air, and and it was it meant so much to her as a a girl from North Dakota who grew up with nothing to have built this life, this big life with all these beautiful things around her and thinking she left it all behind. Like it was so surreal. And it took us, it took us a good year to really go through just the house and get it organized enough to sell it and then put things in storage. And to be honest with you, I mean, I've been through, I think every box by this time, but I feel like I'm still finding things. I have two storage units full of her things. I haven't gotten rid of anything, to be honest with you. I haven't sold anything or donated anything because I was waiting to see what, you know, what I might need this stuff for a movie, documentary, coffee table book. And, and also it was sentimental, but at some point, I don't think I don't want all of this stuff to just be in a storage unit. It makes me sad to think of that. So this stuff will be disseminated. I, I've been to I've been in talks with different institutions where I'll donate things, you know, but she saved everything. She saved photos. I you can see behind me books. There's scrapbooks and photo books and books of all the places that she's performed and what songs she sang. She had these show books with her lighting cues and her gowns and she documented everything. It's like, she's left me this. Um, I think about it as like a treasure map and I'm searching and I have little hints and clues along the way. I think that's remarkable because you can tell how organized and meticulous she was and how much she cared about her delivery, her presentation, her artistry. Tell me, when you're making executive decisions, I know you mentioned that you there are things you wish you could have asked her, but you didn't think to ask her while she was alive. Do you sometimes feel her presence with you or around you? I feel like she's with me every single day, every day. And I mean, not only because I have her pictures and I can listen to her voice. I, I have her music, but I also have her interviews. So I think that I'm so blessed that I can hear her talking still. Like I have, I don't have as much of my mom who also passed away, you know, her speaking. So I'm really blessed to have like this around me all day long. And so I feel her presence every single day. And I just take her and my mom along with me, no matter what I'm doing. Like when I just went and did a speaking engagement in New York, I, I just invite them to be there with me. I take, I wear jewelry that was theirs. And so I take them with me and I feel like they're with me, both my mom and my grandmother every day here. Well, you know, you strike me as a very intuitive person and someone who's open to that kind of energy. And I believe very strongly that your mom and your grandmother are not only with you, guiding you and protecting you, but I think they're also very grateful to you because you're doing this with class, with dignity, you're being strategic, you're honoring her memory in a way that's noble and not just money-based, but it's based on what you think your grandmother would have wanted for you. So as a fan, I oh. want to express my gratitude to you for doing doing it your way, her way. Oh, thank you, Harvey. That is so wonderful to hear you say that. Thank you. I really, that means a lot to me. I feel like I, it's funny. I don't, I don't think about like, oh, how much money is this going to make? Or how much money is this? 
I don't even think about that. I think about how many more people will know about her music, how I want people to know her story and to hear her music. It's her songs are so timeless and that's, that's my driving force. And I know I have to say social media has been a, a really amazing thing and having this archive here to pull from and that I can share her with people that way too. And that's my, always my number one motivator is how people can know her better and almost have continue to have a relationship with her now. Like I still have a relationship with her now. Well, since you're talking about people getting to know her better and all the new ways in which we can do that, what about a movie based on Peggy Lee's life? When is that going to happen? She's got the perfect story. It has all the elements of a fabulous motion picture, don't you think? I 100% agree. Do you know that we have been working on this for 15 years? Really? Yeah, 15 years. That I met with Reese Witherspoon for the first time 15 years ago. And we. it has been the most twisting up and down roller coaster this movie journey and we were weeks away from starting filming finally and then it got postponed due to COVID oh. and we have Todd Haynes the most unbelievable director Doug Wright an incredible writer Michelle Williams was going to play my grandmother and Reese Witherspoon executive producing and Mark Platt. And now it got, it was, we had the locations, we had, everything was ready to go. And then the, that Omicron wave came through and we got postponed. So now I'm waiting for the stars to align again and schedules to align and to get it back on track. We have an unbelievable script and that's that, that, that Todd and, Doug wrote so beautifully. Anyway, when I, I was so upset and so disappointed to get so close to getting it done and then to have it taken away like that. And I thought when I was having a pity party, I thought, well, what would my grandmother say right now? And she would say, trust the timing. So then I just kind of let it, let it go. And it's going to happen when it, when it's meant to happen. But I, I have a bucket list of things that I want to get done while I'm here on, in my lifetime. And that's this movie, a, an in-depth documentary where you really get to see behind the scenes and a coffee table book and a stage musical. There's just a little bucket list of things that I need to get done. I'm glad that you're telling yourself to listen to what your grandmother would have said, because timing is everything had the movie started and then been shut down in mid-production because of COVID, there would have been a whole host of other problems. Your grandmother's popularity only keeps growing. As I mentioned, look at the number of shows where her songs are appearing and commercials. Don't worry, it's going to happen. And when oh. it does, I'm going to be knocking on your door, asking you to come back to the show to promote that fabulous movie. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Harvey. I love that positive thinking. That's good. That's really good. It's something that I want for her so much because her story, you just don't hear stories like that anymore. Like when you ask people, how did you get your start? If I went on, you know, you can get an agent and a manager and American Idol, or there's all these different ways you move to Hollywood. But this is like crazy that she took a train out here. Oh my gosh. Wait till you see this script. So. Well, I think it's very, very important as a piece of history. You know, I remember when Carol King, when her musical came out, it was called Beautiful. Right. And everyone was going on about this is so important because she's one of the first singer songwriters. Well, Peggy Lee came along way before Carol King and right. had an equally compelling story, perhaps more so. And so I think it sets the record straight. It educates people a lot about the evolution of the music industry and about the evolution of women in the music industry. And of course, that amazing timeless music, the voice, the message of taking control of your own life, your own career, it's timeless. 
So please, my dear Holly, I feel like I'm your Uncle Harvey here saying, don't worry, it's going to happen. I know it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, you're right, though, in the in the 40s, when she started writing music, this wasn't happening back then, where very many artists at all were singer songwriters. And so it was really unusual, and especially her being a, a woman, and then having the forethought to start a publishing company and and she held on to it for all these years and that's the company that I run to this day and I always say that she would tell me there's going to come a time in your life when you're desperate for money and you might even be tempted to sell this catalog and these songs and you can't she said you have to figure out another way you can sell diamonds jewelry you cannot sell these songs and and here we are you know, 2023, still with the same company that she started, Denslow Music. Well, she managed to withstand, you know, the British invasion, rock and roll, the hippie era. She had tremendous longevity. She had an ability to reinvent herself and sing songs in the 70s and 80s and 90s. She was still so fresh. Now, obviously, Peggy Lee and her music will always be eternal, are your children willing to carry on the work of maintaining her legacy after you and I are gone? Yes, I'm already starting to train my kids. I don't know if they will do what I do and take over this company, but what they for sure will do is be a part of her legacy forever. In fact, this trip I just took to New York and North Dakota for these events, these Peggy Lee events, I took my youngest son, who's 18, with me and he learned so much about my grandmother and i said these you know these stories i don't want i don't want them to go with me so i'm telling as many stories as i can and to my kids and interviews because i want it i want it out there i want it to live on and and i said these this will be your story like how you went to north dakota and you learned about your grandmother your great grandmother so they're both incredibly proud of her. Well, Holly, I must tell you, it's been such a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for everything you've done to honor the incredible life, career, and body of work of your dear grandmother. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you so much for having me, Harvey, and for asking such great questions. I really appreciate it. Well, I can't wait to have you back when the movie comes out. Me too. <laughs> me too. Our guest has been Holly Foster Wells, granddaughter of the legendary singer and songwriter Peggy Lee. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.